I'm Fazri Abdul Rashid, but you probably know me as Faka Faz. I make a living telling jokes, and at the same time, I'm trying really hard not to become one. I work my way to the top, right? I may not have O levels, but I have a Netflix special, alright? You must be wondering, what's a jester like me doing hosting a show on CNA? Let me explain. I've built my entire career on the internet. It's helped me promote myself and gain a following. We're going to talk about cyber security. But I'm a slave to the digital world. Without my website or my social media platforms, I'll be lost. Which got me thinking. All my data is online. What if I got hacked? I don't want to get punked by some hoodie-wearing hacker with a taste for a comedian's private information. I'm not the only person with high stakes in today's tech-dependent world. We are all at risk of losing our data, our privacy, even our hard-earned money. I want to learn more. My journey into cybersecurity has already begun. I've learned about passwords, encryptions, and even phishing attacks. But there's always more to learn. Who's behind our cyber security? What are they doing to keep us safe? And who are these hackers anyway? Can we stop them? How? Is there anything I can do on my own? What? Why do I have so many questions? I need answers. Now! I am not a Luddite, but neither am I a tech genius. The jargon in this two-bit universe goes well over my head, so I've decided to dip my toes into this workshop organized by Kodomo. Let's see if I can learn a thing or two. Kodomo is a startup that aims to educate through design and technology. So why a board game? It's so mystical, like the whole internet, the whole concept of the internet is mystical. We're just trying to get away from that yeah. and present it in a way that's digestible, right? And it's fun. Potato Packets is a board game that brings networking and cybersecurity concepts to life. In the game, you're supposed to strategically position your servers and send data to your clients who are scattered all over the map. Sound simple? Here's the twist. On the internet, your data does not get delivered directly to your clients, but will have to hop through multiple nodes in the network before reaching them. For example, when you Google something, the requested data from your phone will route through multiple points, such as your home router, internet service provider, and then finally to your screen. So prepare to fend off pesky cyber attackers who will sabotage you while your data is in transit. So how will playing a game like this help me in the future when it comes to cybersecurity? Data is getting more and more valuable. So a lot of cyber crimes are moving on a lot of crimes are moving online. And just to give you put things in perspective, more than 10 million cyber threats are happening every day around the globe. For example, there's a firewall, so you can actually block traffic. So let's say right. you want to block malicious traffic, mm -hmm. you can use a firewall so they can all pass through. Yes. The game has all these cards you can use to attack or defend the other players. But the one card that stood out to me was Man in the Middle. Man in the Middle. Something about this sounds so sinister. Who is this man? What is he in the middle of? I need to know more about this threat, and I'm going to meet someone who has the answers. Hey, 
What's up, Paul? Hey, how are you? Hey, thanks for meeting me today, man. Of course. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, how does a man in the middle attack apply in the real world? Um, yeah, let me show you a bit about that. Uh, do you want anything to drink? Uh, yeah, give me a coffee. Hey, here's your coffee. Hey, thanks, man. Oh, of, co <laughs> of course, man. Uh, were you uh, checking out your WordPress blog and then also looking at uh, tennis shoes? Yes, but how did, how did you know that? Yeah, so uh, actually you connected to our Wi-Fi instead of the cafe's Wi-Fi. Essentially, we could see everything that you were doing as well as what you were typing in. So I saw your password is Wait, 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 wait. So I logged in to that Wi-Fi and that Wi-Fi was yours. Yeah, that's a great example of a man-in-the-middle attack. So essentially, we can see pretty much everything you're typing into non-secure websites. Okay, can you take me through step by step how that happened? Yeah, so essentially, uh, what we did was we uh, copied the Wi-Fi name. Uh, then when your computer reached out, um, we replicated it and you connected to it. Uh, and then because your uh, website is insecure, essentially, when you typed in your password, we can see everything that's happening there. Okay, so you got me, man. You got me. Yeah. I don't want this to happen to me again. I don't want anybody else to have this happen to them. So tell me, how can someone make sure that they are secure when they're outside using, you know, a public Wi-Fi? Yeah, I think the, the first and easiest thing to do is make sure when you connect to a Wi-Fi, it's actually what you think you're connecting to. The second would be to make sure that you're using um, websites that are secured with SSL. Yeah, so it's the secure socket layer, uh, mm -hmm. which is essentially is just a secure connection from you, uh, your computer, to that web server. And what it does is it actually encrypts the packets that are going across. Mm -hmm. um, so essentially, when you uh, look at the website, uh, the URL in the browser, uh, you just want to make sure there's a little lock in the top left-hand uh, part where you type the URL. So that's HTTPS. So what is that? What, what is that HTTPS? HTTPS is essentially a secure uh, transport protocol. Mm -hmm. um, so what that means is you can actually communicate from your computer uh, to a server um, sec secure uh, through an encrypted uh, channel. Um, so it okay. actually encrypts the traffic from your computer to the server itself. Okay. Um, and actually here uh, on the web browser, you can actually see uh, if we go to your website, it actually says not secure in the top left. Oh. Um, but if yes. we go to another website, um, it will actually say secure. And that's because mm -hmm. on your website, you don't have HTTP. Uh, S, uh, and on this uh, website, it does use HTTPS. Let's go back to the past when snail mail was still a thing. Imagine, you wrote a beautiful, enduring love letter to the girl of your dreams and mailed it. Now, what if, instead of delivering your letter, the postman <gasps> opens it and rewrites it to suit his own nefarious intentions? Maybe now your crush might be reading a letter from you calling her all sorts of nasty names. Mr. Postman, AKA the hacker, is carrying out a man in the middle attack. In other words, he would be positioning himself between you and the website and intercepting any kind of data you might be submitting. So Paul mentioned this thing called HTTPS and how it makes the internet a safer place for all of us. But how exactly does it help us? When in doubt, Ask Google. No, I'm seriously going to ask Google. Parisa Tabriz is a computer security expert who works for Google as a director of engineering. Going by the title of security princess, she oversees the web browser used by a billion people. Hey, Parisa, um, I know you're busy, so thank you so much for giving me the time. So tell me, why is HTTPS so important online? HTTPS is really important because it allows you to have end-to-end -end encryption online. It's a way to have um, secure communication whenever you're accessing any site so that you can be guaranteed there's nobody in the middle that's actually tampered with the communication or eavesdropped on it. So how exactly does HTTPS prevent any attack? The web can feel really fast, but in reality, whenever you're kind of loading a website, it actually goes through a number of different intermediaries. And each of those points in the middle can be a place where somebody can actually intercept that connection. So what HTTPS does is it actually guarantees that none of those intermediaries uh, can, can intercept the connection or be an active man-in-the-middle attacker. So exactly what would happen if I were to use a website without HTTPS? 
you really have no guarantee that any of the data you type into that site hasn't been intercepted. When you're logging in and sharing a password, which is really sensitive, or credit card information, you want that guarantee that nothing between you and the actual service that you're interacting with um, can read that data. And without HTTPS, you don't have any guarantee that that hasn't happened. So Parissa, what would it take to make the internet a more secure place in the future? I remember when I was uh, growing up, my parents said, don't buy anything online. It's not safe. Now they're one-click shoppers and they do all of their banking online. And because of the advances we've made in, in security, uh, I am a realist. And I don't think we'll ever reach a point when everything is secure and there's no problems. Farming is often called the backbone of the world. I still look at it as backbreaking work, waking up at first light and slogging through the day, but it doesn't have to be that way anymore. In 2016, a Dutch company invented a device that farmers could hang around each of their cows. Suddenly, they had real-time information on all their animals' behaviour. They could predict productivity levels, when the cows were eating, when the cows were drinking, and even predict if they would get sick. An ordinary farm was now a smart farm, and it took just one device. Now imagine us urban folk with all our gadgets. IoT, the Internet of Things. It is a thing worth talking about. The term refers to this vast system of computing devices that have the ability to connect to each other without the need for us mere mortals. For example, the only reason you can ask your speaker to play your favourite song is because of the IoT. It's essentially about connectivity. And now with cloud computing, the Internet of Things just got a massive assist. Hi, welcome to Harry's Electrical. Hey. OK, so if you'd like to follow me, over here we have a smart washing machine. Yep. Um, so you download the app on your phone, which connects you up to your appliances. With washing machines, you also have fridge freezers and ovens and other appliances, which we'll talk about shortly. So what you do is you tell the app, yeah. and then the app talks to the washing machine, and the washing machine says, right, OK, we have a load here of white T-shirts and, and, and light-coloured jeans, which will be fine together. However, you've also got a, a set of red socks in there, and it will say, actually, no, let's remove the socks, and we'll tell you how to wash your socks in another load. It just takes the whole thinking process out of washing. Do you think this function will make lives easier? I think this function is the future. Really? Yeah, like I said, today, how people are on the move all the time, how we are working more hours than we've ever worked before, you know, and how we have much busier lives. This is the future now. Home Connect is an app that lets the user connect all their devices to their household items. Um, that's the great thing about Home Connect. When you're buying your food, so long as you get into the habit of putting in the expiry dates or the used by dates which are on the packaging of the products and you, you connect them, you, you, you load them into the Home Connect, mm. it will tell you when something's about to expire. So what are the benefits of having Home Connect with an oven? So for example, if you're on the go and you know that tonight you want to have a roast chicken for dinner, you can put your chicken and your trimmings in the oven first thing in the morning before you go to work. Okay. Yeah. Other little things like uh, nice perks is that the app always updates new recipes and it, it, it works accordingly to how your lifestyle and what you like to eat. Does it tell you how the chicken's going to taste? It doesn't tell you how the chicken's going to taste. That's all on how you are going to marinate the chicken, unfortunately. <laughs> you have to do some work. Some of the work is down to you. This just might be the cynic in me, but if the whole world is connected, wouldn't that mean that a vulnerability of any kind could affect every single smart product we own? I don't know what the answers are, but I know who does. Ken Munro is a cybersecurity researcher who's recently been looking closely at IoT devices. Okay, there, I see a lot of things here on the table. What are these things? These are like regular things, but I guess they're special in some way. But we found vulnerabilities in this one, which meant you could actually hold the thermostat to ransom. So you <laughs> couldn't turn on your AC, you couldn't turn on your heating, unless oh, no. you gave the uh, hijacker cash. 
So we did this as a proof of concept to show okay. that actually ransomware was possible, but we've seen people's smart devices start to be taken control of and hacked, which is worrying. That's insane. This is like a curling iron, cameras, these are dolls. What are these dolls for? Oh, yeah. I love this one. So these <laughs> doll, this is my friend Kayla. Mm -hmm. She's brilliant. She's an interactive talking kid's doll. OK. So the idea is that your kid can uh, have an interactive conversation with this dolly, right? Oh, no. So cute, right? Yes. Now, what I liked is on the box, when I saw her in the retail store, it said mm. that she was internet safe and, and child friendly. Mm. And it suggested that uh, she had anti-swearing filters. OK. So I'm thinking, looking at this doll, going, can I make you swear? <laughs> so I prepared one for you. Oh, yeah, and you did. Should we give it a go? Yeah, let's go. OK. Hey, calm down, or I will kill you. <laughs> it's not all just about being crazy, though, right? Yeah. So there's actually some really worrying privacy concerns mm. here as well. So because there's no encryption on the Bluetooth connection, it means that anyone nearby, so maybe 40, 50 metres, Mm. can listen to the microphone and speak to the child through the speaker. So unpleasant people can creep on your kids. And because of that, she was banned in Germany. OK. So tell me some of the interesting cases that you guys have dealt with when it comes to IoT devices being compromised. Well, here's a fun one. I've got a shocking example for you. Okay. Would you like to uh, put this device on? Sure, sure. Joe, do you think we should have some fun? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this is oh, a... Dude, <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> So this, uh, again, <laughs> similar to a lot of these devices, uh, okay. is controlled from a phone via Bluetooth. Now, normally, if you're connecting to a Bluetooth device, you normally okay. ha uh, have the opportunity to enter a, a pin to pair, yeah. you know, a four-digit code, so yeah. that you know that each device is who they say I, they are. I feel you're setting me up for something <laughs> really painful. Now, <laughs> with a device like this, there's only uh, you know one button on it. There's no way to really put a, a code on it. So mm. they've had to drop the requirement to actually pair to it in a secure way. Okay. What that means is anyone can pair to that device. Uh, they need no. They don't. They just need to be within range of it. Yeah. And uh, once. Uh, this particular device is in range. Uh, anyone can uh, push a button and. Mm hmm. Uh... Mm -hmm. Over here. Oh, please work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this device is actually designed to give you an electric shock. Uh, the reason being, if you're quitting smoking, if you're. Oh. Uh, trying to break a habit, the mm. idea is you can either push the button on here, which administers a little shock. IoT devices are supposed to make life more easy, right? But it seems that it's actually opening yourself up to more risks. So there is a good case for IoT. So for the elderly, for living independently for longer, mm. for, for healthcare, I think it's a great idea as well. And also, I think we can be this more right efficient. Here. But the problem is, is most manufacturers don't take security seriously. So most times, nothing. We tell them, we send them emails, we try and telephone them, we get nothing. They don't respond. A very small number of vendors do, so the people that ring were really good, they responded very quickly, fixed the bug straight away. But most times, the manufacturer just ignores us. Are more and more people now getting more aware of their IoT devices um, being vulnerable? I hope so. We're trying to shine a light on this so that manufacturers can't just ship a product on the market that exposes our data. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, with the advent of some regulation and some laws, we'll see consumer IoT devices get much, much safer to use. The world around us is becoming increasingly connected. Being reliant on these connections means that every single aspect has to be protected, and they're just not. They are vulnerable. The chain is only as strong as its weakest link. The world has now seen plenty of viruses that made their mark and wreaked havoc in the process. There has been malware designed to infect entire systems and virus that spread via email. Believe it or not, the first virus ever created had more benign beginnings.
all the way back in 1986 in Lahore, Pakistan. 32 years ago, these two brothers were responsible for the creation of Brain, a virus that many consider to be the world's first ever PC virus. Mr. Alwi, why did you create the Brain virus? So I learned a little bit about DOS and uh, how to develop software. So I started learning assembly as well as uh, uh, basic language. And I, we found a lot of uh, weaknesses in the DOS operating system. We used to discuss about uh, different ways to work around uh, those security loopholes and, and to find out. Uh, and we used to challenge each, each other how we can exploit it. So how did you plan to spread the virus? challenge was uh, how to spread this virus uh, without having an uh, internet or without having any, any connectivity. So we chose how to do it on the floppies. And uh, there was a time we need to develop some software like uh, for a hospital uh, in Quetta that was uh, run by an NGO. So they asked me to write a small so piece of software for the data collection of the patients for, for their statistic uh, analysis or for, for their own purposes. I just put that code and, and put an a, a indicator marker as our address and, and phone numbers to see that whether that code which we wrote for, for that NGO will stay there or will go somewhere else in the world. And somehow they copied the data and that, that's how the infection or that uh, virus or that our brain code was transferred to their floppies. And somehow it was spread it out uh, in, in the world. How did you find out that the virus was spread? So I received a call from, uh, from a Mi Miami University, some student. So she said, oh, well, my floppy shows uh, a slightly lesser space in it. So she asked me that, oh, uh, we have a problem. One of my friend, uh, he digged into the, in, into the floppy and found your number. And uh, there was an instruction that uh, they should contact me. Then it hit my mind immediately, oh, oh my God, what I've done, you know. So it, it has reached somewhere out, out of Pakistan. So th that was a kind of a worry for me and excitement for me also. So what was your original intent in creating the brain virus? Well, uh, just to prove this thing that uh, the DOS has a weak uh, security. If, if there is a background process running, you, nobody will know it. And uh, there's not much uh, protection against uh, any, any external code to run on, on, on the DOS. And uh, code can, can spread or a virus can spread without a network. And I think those, those things were pr proven very well. If a virus could spread halfway around the world without the internet, just imagine how much faster and easier viruses spread nowadays with the internet connecting computers everywhere. I'm about to enter a war zone where cyber warriors fend off new attacks every second of the day from everywhere around the world. Welcome to our Singapore Security Operations Centre. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of our uh, global security operations centres. Wow, this is straight out of the movies. So what's going on here? What's going on here, this map uh, really is showing you traffic flows by country, um, the type of attack that we're seeing in the systems that we're monitoring. Mm -hmm. It then gives us some ranking tables and shows us the top originating countries, the top destination countries, the types of attacks that are occurring. So these are live attacks this that are happening live. now? This is live, this is all live wow. data. Yeah, you just need a buzzer and a red light. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> that's, that's all that this room is missing, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just those and, 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 and everybody just gets we on it. We can probably arrange that. <laughs> We have billions and billions and billions of events mm -hmm. come into the SOC every day. Okay. They go into our analysis system. But what we care about is not the stuff that has been blocked. We care about the stuff that has got through. Yeah. So we run all of these analytics and all these modules and machine learning models that say, this is suspicious. Out of all of the pieces of information that have come to us, mm. there's something that needs to be investigated. There's mm. something going on here. And if something bad is happening, that's when the, the team kicks into action. Every nation, mature nation state in the world now, mm -hmm. has a cyber division. You know, we had land, sea, air mm -hmm. as um, branches of the military. Yeah. We now have cyber. 
So, okay, so take me through um, what happens when when you guys uh, detect an attack. Mm. Sure, I'll send it over immediately. Okay. Bye. So, the, the, as you can see, um, uh, Ryan's investigating this. He's looking at, you can see file hashes here of malware. Yeah. He's uh, looking at what's talking to what, who else has detected this malware, what other vendors are, are working on it, um, what type of thing it is, what it's doing inside the customer environment on this side here. Malicious software, malware. It's the general term for what makes our computers sick. And so the computer visits the doctor to get a diagnosis. And depending on the symptoms, a poor computer could be suffering from a range of illnesses. But it's never as easy as just taking your medicine and recovering. In fact, malware is a piece of code that can do long-lasting damage if not prevented. Sometimes, it will allow the hacker to spy on your activities. Sometimes, it could give them control of your computer, which could lead to them blackmailing you. So, why are new types of malware being created all the time? Well, it, this is um, a, a, a real, very good indication mm -hmm. of how mature the cybercrime market is. Cyber criminals will move from one thing to another very quickly. In the software industry, we call it pivoting. Mm -hmm. They will pivot very quickly to whatever makes them the most money. Yeah. They are true criminal enterprises. What's happened over the last few years is with the rise of cryptocurrency and the ability for people to take payments anonymously yeah. and to move funds around, yeah. um, it's taken into the, its next phase. Hackers may have many unique motivations behind their deeds. Power, infamy, ideology, or just plain chaos. But if you ask me, it's all about the money, baby. Ever since the first cryptocurrency Bitcoin was introduced, more interested parties have gone above and beyond to mine this virtual currency in cyberspace. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Cryptojacking. Cryptojacking is the covert and malicious use of someone else's computer to mine cryptocurrency, and it is carried out in two ways. Hackers can execute this by cleverly getting their victims to click on a harmful link via their email. This would load a crypto mining code onto their computer. The other way is for them to infect websites or online ads so that any unaware user who clicks on it will become the next oblivious victim. In both ways, the cryptojacking is carried out in the background as the unsuspecting victims use their computers normally. The only signs they might notice is a slower performance or lags in execution. Thank you. Now that you understand what cryptojacking is, you must be asking yourself, is it really that bad? Well, if I want to be honest with you, absolutely, yes. I'm in the capital city of Assam, Guwahati. This is where Indrajit and his fellow researchers discovered cryptojacking malware in several popular websites, some of which were run by the Indian government. In crypto jacking, what they do is mining from one laptop is very difficult. Like you won't get much money. Yeah. But just think if you mine using hundreds and thousands of computers, then you'll get money, right? Mm -hmm. So if I give you a very rough example, let's say mining with one laptop will give you one dollar. So if you use 10,000 laptops, mm -hmm. you will get ten thousand dollars yeah. As simple as that. We wanted to see if crypto jacking is coming to India. Uh, so for that, we thought that let's make a list of all the government websites and scan them to see if any of the websites have crypto jacking scripts running in them. Uh, we got these two websites. Uh, here also, once mm. again, AP government, we got the same. So basically, this is the script, CoinHab script, mm -hmm. which hackers, they hack the website, they put the script. What does it do to your computer? Okay, so I'll show you a demo. So what I have done is, I have made a video. I'll say that, watch this video to know how to get iPhone for cheap. As you can see right now, my CPU, only 16% is being used. Mm -hmm. Graph is very low, mm -hmm. right? Now I'll open this page. So oh, as dude. you can see, 
it went 90%, 82%. What's happening right now? Yeah. What's happening? This script is using the full uh, CPU resource, as you can see, 100%. And after some time, even my fan will start moving because things will start getting hit hitting up. But if you check the website, it looks very normal, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing fancy. So why did they choose to target government websites? Because for crypto to be successful, they need a website which have like millions of traffic, mm -hmm. millions of views per month. So it's a lot of traffic. Yeah. That's what you're saying. So more yeah. traffic, more people are, uh, more computers are being used to mm -hmm. mine cryptocurrency. So the hacker is making more money. Yeah. Indrajit played his part in discovering the crypto mining malware and reporting it. But the Indian government has also stormed into action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the understanding of the common man is that if a website belongs to the government, it would be the safest website. Yet, uh, some of these websites still get compromised. Uh, how do you think this is possible? I don't want people to get an impression that all government websites are insecure. But at the same time, the responsibility of the government to ensure higher levels of protection is definitely there. A couple of things that we have done. So we run online programs to ensure that even a common citizen becomes aware of what is happening. Mm. I'm also the officiating vice chancellor of a large university here. And we have taken a decision that regardless of which course you do in that university, mm. each student, every student has to do a basic module on cybersecurity. While we are becoming more and more sophisticated, countries mm. like India are encouraging more and more users, internet users, through devices largely, yeah. but a very, important adverse consequence of us becoming more and more digital mm -hmm. is the threat on cyber security. Yes. So if someone still feels that it is business as usual, I will remain immune to uh, cyber security threats. There are many human beings who feel that no disease will come to them. They remain in that kind of a uh, fool's paradise. Mm -hmm. So that can actually become very dangerous for you because uh, there are, I know, serious gangs today who are trying to steal data, who are trying to damage countries, that a bloodless warfare is happening in the world. I started my journey hearing stories of my friend's social media accounts being hacked. And now I find myself talking to government officials about wars. It's a testament to the inherent power of our cyber world that something as simple as not securing our passwords can lead to a disaster on a global scale. I guess the same technology that affords us the chance to make a difference through the internet is also the gateway for insidious elements to make their mark. The date is 4th of June, 1903. Italian inventor and electrical engineer Guglielmo Marconi is on the verge of demonstrating his latest innovation in the historic theatre of the Royal Institution of Great Britain. But he's 480 kilometres away in Cornwall, which is precisely the point. Marconi is about to showcase his new encrypted wireless system, which he claims can securely send messages over long distances. And it works! The receiver in the lecture theatre sparks into life and the steady tap of the Morse code printer starts revealing the message. Rats, 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 rats! Followed by a limerick written sharply just to insult Marconi. Confused? Don't be. Marconi's system had been hacked by none other than Marconi's longtime rival, Neville Maskelyne. Maskelyne could have been one of the world's first hackers, and of course, he does it with a flourish and an insult. What Maskelyne did to Marconi certainly humiliated him, but it wasn't a crime. His antics that day were the actions of a man looking to disapprove the so-called security of a system. And the spirit behind it rings louder today than it has ever done. We call it ethical hacking, and the white hats who excel at it might just be our real-life superheroes. In Singapore, groups like HackerOne organize bug bounties where ethical hackers sniff out vulnerabilities and get paid for it. 
So the first ever Bug Bouncy program that was ran was in 1983 by a, an operating system company called Hunter and Ready. Mm -hmm. So interestingly, their slogan says, um, get a bug if you find a bug. So anyone that has found a vulnerability and reported it to them actually gets themselves a Volkswagen Beetle. So how cool is that? So tell me a little bit about what the Bug Bounty program is. The Bug Bounty program basically is where a company decides to offer monetary rewards mm -hmm. to hackers out there, um, whether or not it could be a private or a public one. But basically, if you find a vulnerability, you get to win um, you know, money. So in 2018 alone, um, HackerOne paid out almost 26 million Singapore dollars to hackers. So that is just one year alone. How does HackerOne fit into this? So rather like the middleman, like what you would think, what a bank does, they facilitate um, depositors and lenders and become they are like the middle person. And for HackerOne, we're the same. Um, we're like the industry experts in this industry. We have 500 over 1,000 hackers on the community. Why would I as a company want to pay someone to hack into my system? For what? What you want is to get a fresh perspective from another hacker to be able to find uh, vulnerabilities in your system. So if you're only dealing with like their in-house people, you may not be able to see things in a different way like a hacker can. Because there's always a stigma that hackers are bad people. Yep, yeah, definitely. The image of a hacker has been evol evolving. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the past, you would think that if you're a hacker, you're a bad guy who's trying to hack into my system to steal something. But right now, um, you can see how important of an asset a hacker is mm -hmm. to many organisations, even to government organisations. We want to humanise hackers. We want hackers to be recognised um, the work that they're doing. Because eventually, like we said, the goal is to keep the internet safe. I get why bug bounties exist. It's the idea of prevention being better than the cure. But what would compel a hacker to do it? Only a bug hunter themselves can answer that question. Tell me how a bug bounty, aka hacker, thinks. When it comes to the uh, bug bounty hunters, mm -hmm. they have to think a step ahead of other hackers. Right. Because this is the only way that you can out hack other hackers. Because um, bug bounty is a competition. You have to think smarter, faster than others. Can you tell me um, some cases of severe vulnerabilities that happen during, you know, bug hunting? Yeah, uh, one of the bugs that uh, someone found uh, is he can hijack anyone's Instagram account. Wait, 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 wait. So anybody's Instagram account? Yeah. So when did this happen? Uh, it happened one or two months ago. Uh, it was possible because uh, Instagram forgot to check uh, if the hackers can brute force the uh, password reset code. Mm -hmm. So the hacker was able to brute force the password reset code. And theoretically, if the hackers can make a million guesses in 10 minutes, he can hijack anyone's uh, account by resetting their password. I think um, since the beginning of computer, there are good hackers. The reason that it wasn't a common knowledge that there are existence of white ha hackers because the movies or the media, they don't focus on white ha hackers because yeah. black hats is more sexy yeah, yeah, and yeah. it's more eye-catching, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, the white hat hackers are all over the world. They contribute without, you know, questioning, hey, can I get a reward for this? Yeah. Or what can I get if I'm reporting this to you? They, they just want to make this world a safer place. I have to admit, going down this rabbit hole of cyber vulnerabilities has made me paranoid. Are we not safe from anything? But it struck me. Why don't I meet Gaurav Kirthi? He's the Assistant Chief Executive of CSA, the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. If there's anyone who can relieve me of my paranoia, he's the man. Hello, hi. Hi. Buzz. Buzz, Gaurav, nice to meet you, nice man. Nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. Um, Thank you so much for coming down. But I think 
before Gaurav helped me alleviate my paranoia, he wanted to scare me even further. So I like to watch movies. I go to the cinema a lot. I watch uh, streaming shows on my TV. There are some Singaporeans who think that they can download an app to watch these movies for free. I mean, hey, free is better. You don't need to pay for it. And so they will use their phones uh, and they'll download you know, dodgy apps from dodgy places that promise them free streaming movies. Uh -huh. Sounds like a great offer. So we're just going to go here. I'll download this app and install it. Uh -huh. All right, it's asking me for a whole bunch of permissions. Who's got time to read all these permissions? Uh -huh. Just accept it. Uh -huh. Okay, it's installing. And uh, once I open it up, it uh, gives me a couple of pop-ups. Yeah, okay, close all that. Hey, whoa, all of the latest movies, all streaming, all for free. Yeah. Sounds awesome, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so now I'm done with the movie. Mm. You know, I'm going to turn off my phone. Okay. So now my phone is off, the screen is off. Yep. Go ahead and execute. Yeah, so the phone is completely off, but it's recording video. It's Whoa. also recording audio. So even if you think you've turned off your phone and you're no longer vulnerable, actually everything is being recorded by the attacker. And this is just through a bug yeah. off the app? Just a bug off an untrusted app. So that's how dangerous things can get. So the phone is off. Nothing's running, but it's taking a picture. Good. And in fact, he can record our entire audio as well and save it to his hard disk. So be careful what you say, even if you think your phone is off. Oh my goodness, but that is again, scary. When an app asks you for permission to access a lot of things that it shouldn't, think very carefully whether or not you want to install that app. Gaurav certainly did a good job in fueling my anxiety. But hopefully, he can comfort me now. Alright, I, I gotta be honest with you, Mr. Gaurav. I don't know what to do because I see so many vulnerabilities and so many possibilities of myself getting hacked. How do I practice good online hygiene? How do I make sure that I'm 100% safe online? Don't be scared of technology. A lot of people think about technology as kind of a mystical, different world from the real world. But that's not true. Over time, as human beings, we've developed instincts and judgment to help us stay safe in the real world. The same thing happens in cyberspace. And we need to develop those instincts, those judgments to recognize something looks wrong with this website. So once you develop these instincts, it's the same as the real world. You can operate safely with confidence and exploit all of it. If I choose not to use online services, does that mean that I am free from any kind of online attacks? The idea of avoiding technology because you're scared is not a useful concept. And in fact, People who think that the idea and the ideal way to avoid cyber threats is to avoid the internet are probably most at risk because they're not getting themselves familiar with the risks, the challenges, not educating themselves on how to keep themselves safe. So what are some of the challenges that CSA faces? Well, one of the biggest challenges we face is outreach. And outreach is challenging because we have really different parts of our population. You've got your young, tech-savvy, then you've got the older population who didn't grow up with the instincts of the internet. Uh, the second big challenge we have is getting people to join cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a very growing field, it's a very exciting field, but not many people understand what a cybersecurity professional does. Uh, a lot of people have this mental image that it's all guys wearing hoodies in a dark room, mm -hmm. but that's not really the case. So, you're the best person to ask this. Do you have any advice for me, you know, a common man, on how to stay safe online? I've got a few tips. The first one is know what's valuable to you. Your phone is very valuable to you. So make sure that you've locked it properly. The second thing is your accounts. So make sure that your account passwords are secure and make sure you monitor for any unusual activity as well. The third one is links. Don't click on links that you're not sure what they go. Uh, the fourth one is thinking about activity. And this is where it's about developing that judgment and instinct. If you go into a website and things look strange, or suddenly your computer starts heating up, then you know there's something wrong with that site. Stay away from it. Uh, and the last one is about scammers. Make sure that you know what you can provide on the phone over message, and make sure you don't provide too much information to them. Over time, usually more complicated things get simpler, right? Do you think in terms of cybersecurity, we will also find like a one-stop simpler way for us to um, be safe online? Today, most of the phones come with much better security, much better encryption. 
So we're already getting there and we're trying to move more and more devices. And there's a lot of things that we're doing behind the scenes to make sure that the industry also does that. It's great talking to you. This is, I feel like it's not that bad, you know, like, you know, because, because I've been only talking to people who be like, you're going to get attacked, you're going to get attacked. <laughs> you're, you're, you're the only one telling me that it's actually okay if you do this. So, so good. There is hope. Yes. Yeah, there is hope. That's what we want. Asia. It was a documentary about cyber security because cyber security is now of great importance in Singapore. And they, they decided that they needed to employ someone who was an expert. 100% uh, very, very literate about cyber security. Okay, okay, okay. This fellow, right? This fellow would be, would, would be the best bet. And you know what they told me when I asked why me? They said, first, if we can make you understand, we can make everybody understand. <laughs> When I first started this journey into the world of cybersecurity, I was full of worries. And the deeper I went down this rabbit hole, the more paranoid I got. I'm in the wrong business, man. Yes, our security online is fragile. Yes, there are countless ways we can get cyberpunk. But the truth is, that is no different from our real lives. So what do we do? We learn and improve. It's a simple change of mindset. We need to stop looking at our cybersecurity through a lens of confusion and start realizing that this is the world that we live in. Before we know it, this enormous digital world will stop being so big and scary and being secure online will become second nature to us. Who's going to cyberpunk us then?